Good noon hour to everyone um, participating to this webinar um, through Zoom or through Facebook Live. Uh, my name is Pedro Hernandez. I am the Outreach and Engagement Manager for Audubon, California. And I just want to make sure we're extending a very warm welcome to all of our um, network members and allies and just overall interested folks in our cause. Um, today we are going to be um, providing an overview of the San Joaquin Valley or Greater Central Valley rather. Um, and we're going to be focusing on climate change impacts to um, human communities, but in particular as well, you know, the birds we all love and adore. Um, so for folks who are new um, to our webinar series, we will have a couple of opportunities for folks to provide comment um, via the chat function on uh, Zoom, which is at the bottom of your screen. Or if you're joining us on Facebook Live, feel free to drop, uh, drop in um, any comments or questions in the comment section, and we'll do our very best to make sure that our questions are directed to um, the panelists and presenters. Um, but uh, without any further ado, I want to start, um, you know, kind of transitioning us into the content of, of, our, of our webinar. So um, as far as folks following us, um, here's an agenda and a also beautiful great blue heron. Um, uh, after our introductions, um, I'll provide us a quick um, climate change overview of impacts. Um, I'll transition to our policy director who will be discussing the, the, the priority policies for us during this 2020 advocacy day. Um, and then we're gonna have a robust conversation with some of our programmatic staff um, who are leading some of the uh, most cutting edge work on habitat restoration and adapt climate adaptation and mitigation strategies for, for birds in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, and yeah, and again, I just wanna make sure everyone is super clear. If you have any questions, please drop them in the chat and we'll do our best. Um, but for folks who um, attended the last webinar last week, um, we're gonna start this off with a kind of similar process. If you are on Zoom or on Facebook, um, feel free to introduce yourselves with your name, region, and overall observations with what climate change impacts you are noticing in your home region. Um, Again, so we'll spend a couple minutes um, crowdsourcing this and, you know, having a, a quick discussion as a primer for, um, for our discussion. Um, so I'm going to take a second to pull up. Um, yes, and also if you are a chapter member as well. So welcome Marjorie from Alameda. Okay, yes. All right, Merced County, Amelia, hi. Um, we're seeing longest stretches of days over 100 degrees. Yeah, actually, this next week, we're going to start um, hitting 100 degrees again. Um, Marina is saying, very warm days in summer, shifts in rain patterns. Um, Dan from San Francisco is noticing the fire. Barbara Long from Kern County, hello. <laughs> uh, okay, now I see they're all flooding in. So um, I see, let's see, I, I see. I have a comment from Lisa Lynch. Hi, I'm from LA. I'm noticing this climate has improved since quarantine. More birds chirping and the sky looks better, though very hot early in the year. Um, see seawater rising. Uh, oh, Robert Snow from Fresno. Uh, climate change is reducing the numbers of our mascot, the uh, yellow-billed magpie. Um, and for folks in the audience, um, play, play, pay close attention because the yellow-billed uh, magpie is gonna make an appearance during our presentation. Um, let's see, I'm just gonna read a couple more comments. Um, let's see, I, Sharon um, is saying that she lives in Pacifica and notices fewer brewers, blackbirds, as well as less fog in the summer as well too. Um, and Georgette, Georgette um, from Howington is, or sorry, Georgette Howington is saying, I'm a chapter member from Ma Mount Diablo Audubon and the California Blueberry Recovery Program in Contra Costa County. Um, she's observing less bees, butterflies, and insects in general. And I think there are a lot of comments um, overall hinting at like increased weather um, or increased like temperatures, which again is gonna be a big theme for us. Um, so thank you again, feel free to keep dropping in um, your introductions as folks are, are trickling in. And again, we'll be paying very close attention. Um, so, um, very briefly, I'd like to um, go over a couple of different ways um, uh, climate change is, impa is impacting, um, actually, give me a quick second, uh, how climate change is impacting the San Joaquin Valley. 
Um, and before I, uh, I get started, I want to bring attention to two main themes that we'll be discussing um, today. Adaptation and mitigation. Two words that honestly sound kind of the same, but mean different things. Um, and in a nutshell, when we talk about climate adaptation for this webinar, we mean um, altering green infrastructure or existing um, structures to withstand the impacts of climate change. So this can be um, re habitat restoration, um, in particular to, to birds, but this can also be um, restoring wetlands, um, you know, reinforcing shorelines as well. Um, so it, it's kind of retrofitting the world that we find ourselves in um, to meet the climate change demands. And mitigation is kind of is solving the underlying causes. So while one is treating symptoms, which is adaptation, mitigation is the attempt to try to stop the root sources. So for example, supporting the transition to clean energy, um, providing policy uh, uh, standards to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and also supporting carbon um, sequestration with um, green infrastructure as well. Um, but one of the real reasons um, why climate change has um, you know, exploded as an issue over the years as, as something really to be focusing on is um, because there is a, an impact for virtually every sector of, of our society. And I wanted to start off this conversation um, briefly hint, in, um, hinting on the impacts for human health. Um, for folks who, act, who live in the, in the San Joaquin Valley, most of us know through some degrees of separation someone who has asthma or some other pre-existing pre medical condition. And so what we're seeing through increased um, uh, air pollution and increased um, overall temperatures is that, you know, these factors are exacerbating existing issues as well. Um, and so again, we see, um, this, is a, this is a graphic that's um, designed by the California Department of Public Health, um, but it hints on issues like um, severe weather, changes, changes in vector ecology, which is something that's um, increasingly got more attention over the years. And also for allergies as well. The more um, the, early, the more false springs we're getting, um, the, early, the more the um, allergy season is actually being extended. Um, we're also seeing reductions in um, water supply, which will be a, a major focus for the, our conversation at the um, at the tail end of this conversation. And also, um, there are larger international implications like. Um, you know, uh, con uh, climate refugees or folks who are having to leave their homelands due to um, the increased impacts that climate change is having on their, on, on their home area. Um, more specifically for, for California, um, we're seeing how a lot of these issues impact, again, very different ways as in an intersectional manner. So we see agriculture being impacted, we see ecosystems and, their, and biodiversity being impacted as well. Um, the transportation sector um, is also a factor um, contributing to um, uh, contributing to climate change, but also um, as ways people are coping um, with increased temperatures. So you know you have AC in your car, and how how is how likely is it for you to be able to walk to the library or to the grocery store when Fresno is 115 degrees in June? Um, and also um, the concept of climate justice, um, you know, ensuring that climate solutions are also not creating any other um, unintended impacts. But also, um, you know, pivoting to, to Audubon's um, specific work, por work portfolio, um, the Survival by Degrees report, which uh, was released last year, identified two thirds of the birds in North America as at risk um, for extinction due to climate change. And so this is over 130 birds specifically in the Pacific Flyway. Um, but we do know um, that if we do support climate champions and great policy and increase our advocacy, that we can save um, a significant portion of, of the bird population as well. Um, so it's a long way of saying that we can make progress. <laughs> um, some of the ways specifically that climate change is impacting birds is loss of habitat, whether it's, um, again, declining uh, water resources to maintain um, wetlands, for example, 
Um, we're seeing drastic increases in wildfire. Um, the drought was also something that particularly hit um, the San Joaquin Valley. And, you know, having worked on water issues for several years, um, you know, I can affirmatively say that the San Joaquin Valley has still not um, definitively bounced back from the drought that happened less than a decade ago. Um, and many of, the, many of the weather reports are, are hinting that the, that the overall U.S. Southwest is approaching a quote-unquote mega drought. Um, sea level rise is something that um, does not particularly impact the Sound King Valley, but again, is still a overall climate impact for um, bird populations, which we will be addressing on our Friday webinar at 12 as well. Um, the concept of, of false springs is, an, is another um, important factor uh, where essentially it's caused by warm, uh, when, when weather patterns are warmer than usual. This causes um, uh, trees, for example, to bloom earlier and blossom earlier, but if there is a particularly heavy rain or a frost um, after this um, spike in warming period, this can impact um, the overall health of those plants and also affect um, food resources. Um, and again, heavy rainfall um, is something that we're overall just um, uh, seeing from the change in precip precip precipitation patterns uh, <laughs> uh, for California and overall um, weather patterns globally. And so before I um, transition to another section and our policy director who will discuss some of the solutions that we are supporting. Um, I want to take a second to look at, um, to prompt if there's any questions on the climate change um, points that I touched very briefly. Um, so again, I'll wait a couple of seconds uh, or, or a minute or so. Um, if there are any questions, um, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, I'm, can, where can we get the graphics for the California Department of Health and, Cal, and California's fourth climate assessment? Um, we are um, creating a, a, a toolkit which will be released pretty soon. Um, we'll ensure that that is a, um, like both of those links for the reports um, are included in, in that document. But um, I think the, the, the fourth climate change assessment is, is really interesting um, if you just Google it you can find a link and there are regional reports. So if, if anyone is tuning in from, you know, San Diego or, you know, the Bay Area, there are um, regional reports where you can go in and see particularly how the overall um, issue of climate change is, is impacting your specific um, area. And so let me just read through these two. Um, yeah, okay, and also, um, Feel free to check out the survival by degrees report. Um, it's, it's, it has a wealth of information. There also is a climate um, visualizer, which is an online tool. You can um, just type in your zip code and you can, um, there's this really convenient list of the vulnerable um, bird species in your area. So um, we'll make sure to include that in our toolkit as well. Um, but given that this is the right about my time period, I'm gonna transition to um, uh, our policy director, Mike Lyons, who will be um, providing an overview for some of the, our policy solutions um, as well. So um, thank you all again, and I will transition in a second. Well, while Pedro is transitioning over to the slides for the policy overview, again, my name is Mike Lyons. I'm the director of public policy for Audubon, California. I work in Sacramento on issues across the state with Pedro, uh, Juan Altamirano, our legislative lead, and staff like Megan and Sammy that you'll be hearing from today. And we work on legislation and large scale policy. And we've certainly been focused very much on climate change over the last several years. And before I kind of get into our major uh, priorities that we'll be talking about on advocacy day that relate to the content that Megan and Sammy will be sharing a bit later, uh, I want to acknowledge first the time that we're in with COVID-19 and what that has done to the policy arena. Uh, and that as we're advocating for birds, we're also being very mindful of the impact that the crisis is having on people, on the economy, uh, not just in California, but, uh, but internationally. And you know, asking ourselves, how do we help as to be part of the recovery 
uh, to get us back to some kind of normalcy or to adapt to a, a new normal. And so that's affecting our policy priorities for this year. I also want to acknowledge that many of you were probably on the call last week. Uh, this will be a much quicker overview, but I, I wanted you to uh, bear with us because we have a lot of new attendees and visitors too. So we may be covering some of the additional, uh, some of the material you heard last week. Next slide, please. So when we started 2020, we came in ready to do several new pieces of legislation uh, related to climate change and birds, among other issues. And we were looking at a state budget that was robust with new spending in natural resources and still had a $5.6 billion surplus. Now, uh, with COVID-19, a few short months later, we're dealing with a much reduced state budget that even though there are cuts that have already been, uh, been proposed, we are looking at a, a severe deficit um, of tens of millions uh, of, sorry, tens of billions of dollars that we will try to offset with state reserves, but will not completely. And we know from past experience that when there are budget cuts, natural history, our natural resources suffers. That said, we are really focused on uh, about five major areas of work continuing this year and well into 2021. We continue to have priority legislation like AB 3030, uh, a bill which I'll talk about a bit more in a second, to protect uh, or, or to ensure protection for up to 30% uh, of the state's lands and waters by 2030. AB 2016, which is a coastal resiliency investment bill from Assemblymember Stone from Monterey, and a series of bond instruments uh, led by SB 45 in the Senate to uh, put on the ballot, potentially in November, a bond instrument that would put billions of dollars towards natural resource spending and water infrastructure across the state. At the same time, we're looking at the new budget reality, understanding that budget cuts are coming to important agencies like the Department of State Parks and the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and to try to defend against those and make them as strategic as possible. We won't fend them all off, but we're already vastly under-resourced on natural resource investments in the state and the staff at places like Department of Fish and Wildlife are already overworked. And so we wanna to try to mitigate that as much as possible. And then also to actively defend against industry claims that they need shortcuts around environmental review and permitting in order to get the economy kickstarted. And we know from experience that that's not the case. And frankly, that's just opportunistic on the part of some industries. I wanna focus just for a minute. We have many Audubon members that are on this call. And I wanted to focus on these last two, the defense of protections in particular, uh, as a role that chapters have. Uh, I believe that NGOs step up where government is either unable or unwilling to act in accordance with the law or what's needed uh, in the community. And we see that role for NGOs, especially NGOs like Audubon that are rooted in our communities, uh, more at times like this than ever. And so this is the time to be following what's happening locally, to be engaging on local and state and nationally whether it's the action alerts that come from Audubon or whether it's the own actions that you guys are generating from the chapters. So uh, it's a real opportunity and it's a real need right now and it will continue to be so. Next slide. So the first bill I wanted to talk about was AB 3030 from Assemblymember Kalra. And we saw a lot in the chats earlier about the changes in temperature and the changes in local climate that are happening. And we know that the number one way to make birds resilient, and this was the case even before we started talking about climate change uh, in the same way we're doing now, we know that that's habitat. Habitat loss is the number one reason many bird species are in decline, and it's the number one threat as we go forward with climate change. And so AB 3030 seeks to ensure that 30% of California's lands and water, including state-owned lands and uh, federal lands, voluntarily for private lands, that we have permanent protections in place for those by 3030, uh, sorry, by 2030, which has uh, been recommended internationally by the UN and scientists and um, has really been seen as what we need to do in order to maintain a, a balance of biodiversity and human activities in the globe. And we're already seeing that to a degree with COVID-19 where we are in biological imbalance. Uh, we have all sorts of additional health and economic impacts that we may not have anticipated. So that bill is going to the Assembly Appropriations Committee. And in the next couple of weeks, you'll be hearing a lot from Audubon and it'll be focus of our advocacy day on June 2nd. Next slide. 
AB 26, or 2916 from Assemblymember Stone is a bill to uh, take oil and gas revenues from operations in state waters, leases there, and invest them into a fund to help local governments and others prepare for sea level rise. It also uh, invests in natural infrastructure, so wetlands, soft shorelines, the kinds of things that also serve habitat and recreational values. And lastly, it seeks to undo some of the historic inequities with access to the coasts, which have become more and more something that uh, many people are excluded from using and enjoying. And so we would like to see greater investments in making those accessible. The, uh, uh, this bill is also going to the Assembly Appropriations Committee because it has a cost associated with it. We'll have to see how, how it'll go forward this year, but um, this is an issue you'll be hearing more from us both this year and next year on. Next slide. And lastly, there's SB 45 from Senator Allen, and there are, uh, there's a companion bill that will be coming out soon, a revised version in the assembly. And we've seen these kind of bonds before, whether it was Prop 68 a couple years ago or Prop uh, 1 in 2014, which invest billions in water and natural resource infrastructure in the state. Unfortunately, we have not, even when we've had a lot of money in state coffers, invested in restoration and habitat projects at the scale necessary to protect biodiversity and the recreational and access values across the state. This, uh, these kind of bonds um, are sort of a necessary evil right now until we figure out a way to pay as we go. The question of whether or not we'll do a bond this year, given the economic downturn, is very much live, but we will continue to work on the content of the bond, and you'll hear from us uh, that we want to keep pushing on it to make sure whatever bonds move forward have good language for the environment and our priorities. And even if it doesn't go onto the November ballot, that template will serve us in 2021 or thereafter. Next slide. And with that, I'd like to really pass on to my colleague, Megan Hurdle, who'll be talking about uh, the impacts um, of climate change in the Central Valley. And you'll be hearing kind of how this echoes back on our need to protect things like 30% of the land in order to visit, build uh, resilient bird and human communities. Megan? Great, thank you, Mike, I appreciate that. Like Mike said, my name is Megan Hurdle. I'm the Director of Land and Water Conservation with Audubon California. And I just wanna say thank you all for taking time at lunch to join us for this discussion. And from this segment, our hope is really that you will walk away with four concrete examples of how Audubon works in the San Joaquin Valley and even broader in the Central Valley that you can then use as part of your participation of Advocacy Day and on Advocacy Day. And uh, personally, I hope that you walk away with an appreciation of the Central Valley if you don't already have one and of its importance for birds and people. Next slide, please. So uh, you can keep going. Audubon has prioritized the Central Valley because of scenes like this. We uh, know that migratory birds really rely on the Central Valley as a key stopover spot. And this is not a scene that is uncommon in fall and winter. So I live in Sacramento and I can go right outside of the Sacramento capital and see this on the farm field surrounding uh, in fall and winter. And it's really a phenomenal sight. And the bird stats of the Central Valley are incredible. Over 400 types of birds, species of birds are found here in the Central Valley. We get nearly 7 million ducks and geese, a half a million shorebirds each fall and winter and then millions of songbirds this time of year are coming through. And it really points to the fact that the Central Valley is an internationally important area for migratory birds and a key migratory stopover spot. Next slide, please. And one of my favorite stories to tell when we talk about this is the story of the Aleutian goose. So the Aleutian goose, I like to refer to it as the smaller cousin of the Canada goose, which is pictured over here on the right. And the Aleutian goose, when you see it, it actually has a white uh, ring neck band here. And this goose was actually thought to be extinct until researchers found the species, uh, a few of them breeding off the coast of Alaska on the Aleutian Islands, then worked to remove predators both in their breeding grounds as well as protect their wintering grounds where 90% of them uh, come to the Central Valley, has led to a full recovery of this species. And it is actually one of the few species that has been delisted from the Endangered Species Act. So it's in a great example of why protecting habitat really matters and working in the Central Valley for birds really matters as well. Next slide, please. But the Central Valley isn't just important for birds. It's also important for people. 
those that live here and those that live well beyond the border of the Central Valley. So if you have had an almond, or as we like to call them, an almond in the last week, or maybe some canned tomatoes, those most likely came from the Central Valley of California. We have one of the most productive agricultural systems in the world, and about 10 million acres of agricultural land. Next slide, please. But the building of this incredible agricultural economy has really come at a cost. So over the last 200 years in the Central Valley of California, we have lost roughly 90 to 95% of our natural habitat. So on the left, you can see a map here of habitat types like floodplains, grasslands, and riverside forests pre-1900s. And on the right is what we face now, which is very little left of natural habitat. Despite this, we still get huge numbers of birds. So it just points to the importance of the valley for the continuing place it has on the Pacific Flyway migration route. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about how we work on the ground in the Central Valley. One of our key strategies is really to protect the last remaining wetlands in the Central Valley. These really make up the backbone of the Pacific Flyway. That's where a lot of these birds are coming and congregating feeding and refueling before they continue on their long journeys or overwintering and staying on these wetlands. So our work on wetlands involves working directly with wetland managers on the ground to increase the diversity of species they can benefit when they're managing their wetlands, as well as working at a policy level to make sure that these wetlands get the water they need to create the habitat at the right times, as well as the funding to be able to operate. Next slide which leads us to our first example of something that you can talk about on Advocacy Day. And the one thing you can say around this is as elected officials start to think about public recovery funding, so Stimulus Act funding, bond funding, to think about putting money in there to support wetland restoration or construction projects on wetlands. And by construction projects, I mean helping wetland managers put in solar panels so they can pump water to different places on the wetlands or fixing water infrastructure so that they can receive water. You can see the map on the left here shows just how few remaining wetlands we have left in the Central Valley. The red and the blue are the public wetlands. So they're really tiny dots and we need to make sure that they've got uh, the funding and the ability to get the water when they need it. So this is a great economic stimulus thing to ask your elected official for. Next slide, please. The other piece you can talk about, and you can refer back to the story of the Aleutian Goose, is just how important it is to protect the last remaining habitats that are left in the Central Valley. So AB 3030 is the bill that we are advocating for that will do just that. And you can tell the story of the Aleutian or tell the story of how little natural habitat we've got left as you ask them to support this bill and move it forward. Next slide, please. Another one of the priorities we have as we work in the Central Valley landscape is working in partnership with farmers and ranchers to turn their properties into climate solutions. And by this, I mean basically working with the people that are out on the land in a way that helps them sequester additional carbon in their soils while also creating bird habitat. And I'm very excited to talk briefly about our Audubon Conservation Ranching Program, which was launched in California last year. The whole goal of this program is for us to partner with ranchers to help them use cattle to protect and enhance habitat for birds. And then if they meet a set of rigorous standards, they can actually use the label that's on this slide on their beef product when they sell it, which finally gives us as a consumer an ability to support ranchers and land managers who are doing good things for birds and good things for climate. Next slide, please. So as you talk to your elected official, you can ask them to help support Audubon and farmers and ranchers who are interested in managing their properties in ways that contribute to climate solutions and also help bird species recover. And we just dropped into the chat a link on our Audubon Conservation Ranching Program, which provides more information on what this program is about and actually where you can find and purchase some of the beef that comes from this program. So those have been three examples that you can use as you participate in Advocacy Day. And now as we go to talk about our fourth example, next slide please. I am going to invite one of uh, my teammates and an expert in Central Valley issues who has been working for many years to create a diversity of landscapes that looks much like this. Next slide please. 
So with that, I'm going to ask us to put Sammy Arthur on here. Sammy is our director of our Working Lands program and has built an incredible expertise uh, in many bird species, especially the tricolor blackbird, and recently has been leading a tremendous amount of work around groundwater and water supplies in the Central Valley. So Sammy, thank you for joining us. Hey, Megan. Good to be with you. So Sammy, I thought it would be nice for us to have a bit of a conversation and talk a little bit about why water, particularly in the Central Valley, is so important for birds and why Audubon chooses to focus so much of our time and effort on it. Yeah, so you covered really what's special about the Central Valley um, in terms of agriculture, in terms of birds, and water underpins all of that. Um, so, you know, we have millions of migratory birds that come through the Central Valley every year migrating along the Pacific Flyway. Uh, millions of waterfowl, hundreds of thousands of shorebirds, and they're all looking for flooded habitat where they can find spots to land, rest, feed, fuel up, and continue their journey. <clears throat> so that's really uh, what's so important about the Central Valley for Birds is that flooded habitat. Um, over the past 100 years, California has basically dammed all of our rivers coming down from the Sierra. And that's drastically changed the landscape of the Central Valley. We used to have vast floodplains, um, vast west wetlands, and now only 5% of those wetlands remain. Uh, and all of the water that you see when you're driving down I-5, when you're driving down the 99, um, that's all highly managed. So now it's flooded on the landscape through um, deliveries, through canals, you know, pumped through canals um, and flowing onto agricultural fields or pumped out of uh, groundwater wells uh, to put onto agricultural fields to support drinking water, um, but also to support habitat. So the, the remaining wetlands are now managed very similar to like, how a farm is managed. Um, and they're basically what's providing the last habitat for, for birds in the Central Valley. Great, great. That was an, a great example and description. So how, how does groundwater work into this whole picture? Yeah, so it's, sometimes it's funny to work on groundwater because you can't see it. <laughs> and um, there's not as much of that sort of uh, direct connection with, you know, a flowing river or even just water moving through a canal. Um, but even though it's out of sight, uh, it definitely should not be out of mind. Uh, groundwater supplies about a third of our water supply, uh, and in times of drought, it's, it's higher. In times of drought in the Central Valley, we're relying upon groundwater for 40, 50 percent of the water supply. And it's, it is kind of like a savings account in that when you have high rain years, high flood years, that water trickles you know, down through the ground and goes back into underground aquifers uh, and remains there for future use. Um, so it kind of provides this, this, this buffer, and I think there's a direct connection there with climate change because our droughts impact that. Um, so in terms of people, groundwater is directly supplying water for uh, much of the agriculture in the Central Valley. So we have whole areas of the Central Valley that aren't connected to surface water delivery systems, and so they just pump groundwater onto their crops uh, to, to grow food. Um, or to support dairy products, for example. Uh, and then we have small communities throughout the Central Valley that are pumping groundwater for drinking water supplies for, um, you know, uh, home, bait, home use. And then, of course, like I mentioned, uh, the wildlife refuges. So many of the wildlife refuges that are our last 5% of wetlands in the Central Valley um, have surface water deliveries, but a number of them don't. And so they have to rely upon pumped groundwater to provide that flooded habitat for birds. So that's, you know, that's why Audubon is involved in groundwater. That's why we, we care about groundwater, even though we can't see it. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, I, you know, I love it when uh, we get to work on things that benefit birds and people. And this is a great example of thinking about how do we protect water for birds, but also work on some of the drinking water and community access issues that are out there. So when you say you work on groundwater, what does that exactly mean? What does that look like? Yeah, Audubon's work on groundwater is really about uh, working on the implementation of California's new groundwater law. 
so, you know, interestingly, I think as Californians, we like to think of ourselves as like on the forefront of everything. Um, but we're actually the last state. <laughs> we're the last state in the West to uh, to manage our groundwater. And so we're just going through the process now of um, requiring that. And, and that, you know, it looks like kind of the nuts and bolts of it are local areas are required to develop plans. They're uh, required to plan out how to reach sustainability in 20 years. And so there's a clear role for stakeholders and um, Audubon engages in that process to try to make sure that the wetlands and birds are considered in these plans and that their water needs are accounted for and protected in these plans. Um, and I think there's, you know, there's an opportunity for, for everyone to be involved in that because it really is designed to be a public process. So if somebody was listening to this call and wanted to get more engaged in groundwater or water issues, what would you recommend they do? Yeah, I think uh, there's a great opportunity there. And I think one of the biggest, um, well, one thing to note is, so right now folks are developing, the local groundwater sustainability agencies are developing these plans to manage groundwater. Um, so it's happening now, so there's an opportunity to uh, serve on committees uh, with these agencies to review plans, to provide um, comments in, in the public review processes. Um, but this is also, a, it, it's going to be a 20 year or forever process. So it's really, I think, um, it, important to get involved anytime and to be like a consistent voice. It's not, it, there isn't a one window here. Um, so I think being involved in the in the planning process and then I think one of the biggest barriers is just you know these can be really technical really detailed plans and you've got people you know talking about uh, you know all sorts of like sophisticated uh, hydrology but I think not being intimidated by that is kind of a key thing because what really matters is just being a presence to say hey habitat matters birds matter um, is the water for birds and habitat reflected in this plan and are the allocations that you're coming up with, who gets to use water, are you remembering that uh, it needs to go to these wetlands? And, and that's a pretty, pretty you know, direct message and, and you don't have to be intimidated, I think, by kind of the, the super technical nature of some of these plans. That's great. Yeah, I think the groundwater work really highlights in the Central Valley how water, habitat, climate, they're all interconnected. And we need to be working on all those to really have benefit for birds. So all of the people on this webinar hopefully are excited and ready to participate in Advocacy Day. If they wanted to talk to their elected officials about water or groundwater, you know, is there one message or example uh, that you would like them to communicate? Yeah, I think the top line message is really that we need to, um, you know, even though we're in a time of crisis, we need to continue to plan for future crises. You know, we need to, to um, prevent any rollbacks of, of these important uh, environmental laws and regulations um, because they're, they're, you know, they're what's gonna, gonna manage future crises and future issues. So I think that's really a top line message for these legislators is to, to prevent environmental rollbacks, including um, the new Groundwater Management Act. The lingo that we call it is Sigma, but that's not even really <laughs> important. Uh, Sigma is not really important, but um, that's what the, the new act is that was passed in, in 2015 and is being implemented now. Great, great. Well, we're very lucky to have you leading our work on it. So we really appreciate all of your efforts. And before um, I switch to the summary slide for this segment, I do just want to acknowledge we got a question from Denise who was asking, would increasing unimpaired river flows increase and protect wetland, wetlands? And she really highlights the fact that we know that many of the dams and levees that we've put in have led to the extinction or near extinction of many of our fish species. And so should we be advocating for dam removal if it's unlikely to happen? Great question. Um, and, you know, that touches on, on a theme I think we wrestle with uh, all the time in our work, you know, you may have certain um, certain goals that would be best for birds and habitat, but then weighing that with what's what's realistic, what can we accomplish? Um, and so, you know, I think that I think the reality around dams is we have a hundred year history here in California, um, and those uh, those 
dams are now kind of the basis for a massive infrastructure, um, a massive water infrastructure in the Central Valley. So I think that uh, the focus on unimpaired flows is more um, practical than the focus on dam removal. Um, it's more about how do you operate and provide the water in streams that's needed um, rather than the full dam removal, which I, which I don't think is, is, uh, is realistic. So great question, Denise. Hopefully that gave you a little bit of insight into Audubon's position on that. And we will have a chance for additional questions uh, for Sammy and all of our speakers at the end of this. But I'm gonna go ahead and ask uh, Pedro to please put up just the summary slide from this segment of it, if you can. And so just to close out before we switch to the questions and answers, I just wanted to reiterate and summarize some of the key takeaways from this segment. And we will send out this deck afterwards, or you can just put your phone up and snap a quick photo of this. So what can you do? So on Advocacy Day particularly, you can ask your elected official to pass AB 3030. And again, just as a reminder, a great example of why that's important is because we have lost so much of our habitat in the Central Valley that it's really critical that we set goals and objectives to protect what's left so that we continue to be a key stopover on the Pacific Flyway. Also, you can talk about having uh, wetland infrastructure projects as part of any economic stimulus or bond act. These do create jobs at the same time as they restore habitat and make sure that there are places for these birds to go when they're migrating through. And also you can talk about asking for our elected officials to invest in natural and working lands climate solutions. And that's the buzz phrase for working with farmers and ranchers to help them both create habitat and also sequester carbon in their soil through things like cover crops. So that's on advocacy day. And then every day I would just encourage folks to make your yard a bird friendly yard. And there's a link here where you can find a database to help you buy and plant plants. And then also uh, a link to our conservation ranching program where you can find out where ranchers are doing bird friendly management practices and how you can help support them. So with that, I will pass it back to Pedro. Give me one second, trying to pull myself off of mute here. Um, all right, hello, I'm back everyone. Um, and I'm gonna kindly ask the rest of our panelists and speakers to place yourselves on video as well too. Um, yeah, so, so now we're gonna be um, transitioning to the question and answer section. Um, we did hit um, a lot of different pieces of information um, in, in under 30 minutes, um, but if there's any other points of clarification or just generally, um, you know, you have um, staff from Audubon California at your disposal as well too. So feel free to ask questions relevant to the content, um, any of our pro programmatic work, some of the logistics of Advocacy Day. Um, again, we, we wanna really try to create space to make sure that this can be as accessible for whatever needs um, you know, our, our, our members and our, our chapter base has. So um, I'll... Um, and Pedro, just to clarify, yes. are the questions all in the chat box? Um, yes, and then yeah, come up in the chat, um, and we'll direct them to whoever can answer them. <laughs> um, Pedro, before we yes. jump into the questions too, because we have gotten some questions about Advocacy Day, so just sure. to be really clear with everybody, uh, Advocacy Day, again, will be on June 2nd. The registration is now open and has been uh, for a week or two now. You can see the link in the chat. If you haven't yet registered, we encourage you to as soon as possible because we're already taking all the names. There's about three, 400 people that have registered and we're uh, putting them into teams and then we're reaching out to their elected officials. And the sooner we can do that uh, and get people's name, the better. If you haven't done an advocacy day before, or haven't done virtual advocacy, we will walk you through that. The, the people who have registered will get an email from us soon from a team leader with materials that talks about what we've talked about today, as well as logistics and run of day. So that will be available for you as well. And uh, any degree of experience in this kind of advocacy, you're welcome to join us. And uh, it's a chance to learn and to participate. So we hope you guys will do that. Yeah, um, absolutely. So while um, questions are um, coming in, I wanna maybe, uh, ask Mike a question. 
what what have been some of the fruits of the past uh, couple of advocacy days? You know, for folks who maybe haven't been involved in the last couple of years. Well, I think the highlight really has been that last year we passed a, a bill also from Assembly Member Kalra uh, um, to safeguard migratory birds here in California. As many of you know, the federal administration, the Trump administration has rolled back protections under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and taken away those protections from birds that may be killed by things like oil spills or wind turbines. And, uh, and so we passed legislation to make sure that California law will continue to protect birds from that kind of take or those kind of killings, uh, even if the federal government rolls back historic protections for birds. And that bill passed with great strength after member, many legislators heard from members like you after we highlighted it at Advocacy Day and we went in to talk to folks. Assembly member Kalra is the champion this year on AB 3030 and he appreciates the kind of strength and support that Audubon has shown for him in the past and hopes that we'll do that for AB 3030, which is in many ways even more ambitious this year. Okay, yeah, thank you, Mike. Um, uh, let me see. Well, I, again, feel free to drop any questions y'all have. I have a question, um, again, while we're still waiting, for, for, for Sammy now. Um, my understanding of your work and my, uh, my tenure at Audubon is that you're involved in several different um, groundwater planning processes. And, um, you know, I maybe want to just ask, like, what has been successful for you when you're advocating in all these different places for birds? You know, um, what, what, what kind of works or maybe is there any, are there any tips that you can, you know, provide to folks on this webinar of, of how to, you know, talk about birds and, and water? Um, when, when they're being um, in the same conversation as, you know, farmers and people and so many other things? That's a great question. Um, I think from my experience, what, what I've seen is it's, it works well for me to sort of acknowledge those other important uses of water um, and, and not sort of, uh, you know, be blind to that, but still be resolute in my, uh, my advocacy for wetlands and for birds. So uh, I, think, I think that's like the line that, I, that I'm always trying to walk. And in particular, you know, I'm doing this with local agencies in different parts of the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, and I think I notice folks hear me more when, uh, you know, I, I kind of acknowledge or I'm not aggressive about their water needs as well, right? That, that they, uh, their water supporting their livelihoods, um, the food that we eat, um, you know, small communities that drink water, but to also not let that sort of um, diminish my, I guess, commitment to um, saying, hey, wetlands need this water as well. And this is important for, for communities as well, for folks to see birds, um, for folks to visit these habitat areas and have access to, um, you know, beautiful open space. Uh, so I think that's kind of the balance that, that I find works well and that folks sort of hear the message more when, when I approach it with that, um, that tone. Uh, and then I would just say overall kind of just being present and, um, you know, not needing to have all the answers right away, but just, uh, showing up and being present, I think is huge and it, it grows over time. Okay. Yeah. Super interesting. Um, yeah, I, I personally, I was in, curious to see how, what, what the response would be on that too. Um, did I pass here, Seth? Oh, no, you, you passed like months ago. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, as soon as you said hi to me, you, um, but, uh, <laughs> I, I want to also maybe extend that um, uh, a point that you brought up um, to to yourself, Mike and Megan. Um, you know, something that I've 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 been observing through through Audubon's presence in the environmental world is that there have been a lot of interesting coalitions that have been built. You know, um, to solve bird problems, quote unquote. So, um, and and I, I think that also um, helps demonstrate you know, just the widespread support that you know, some of our issues do have. So um, kind of maybe open-ended, are there any interesting partnerships or coalitions um, 
that that have just arisen from from your own um, years of experience working on bird issues that might um, provide insight for how other chapters can build coalitions to to increase support for our issues. Great, Mike, you want me to take the first pass and then pass to you? So uh, we didn't spend a ton of time in this presentation, but really Audubon California has been working for almost 20 years in the Central Valley in close partnership with farmers, which catches a lot of people off guard, right? They don't expect an environmental or conservation group to be working hand in hand with farmers to try to protect and improve bird habitat. And I saw a great question come through on the chat earlier about, well, if we're advocating for 30% of the land protected for wildlife, what, what happens to the other 70%? Are we just letting it go? Well, the truth is Audubon also works on that 70%. And that's where we're working in partnership with farmers to think about how they can manage their crops to benefit birds or at least not harm them. And two great examples of this is our partnership with the rice industry, where we've actually been working with rice farmers after they harvest their rice crop to mimic and recreate wetlands that would have been there historically. And now rice is providing up to two thirds of the diet of some of the wintering waterfowl that's coming through the Sacramento Valley. So it's become a really important surrogate habitat. And a great, another great example is Sammy's work with tricolor blackbirds and dairy industry, where she actually works with farmers to delay harvest to allow nesting birds to finish. So that's a, an example of an unusual partnership that I think has been very successful and that we continue to work on. I think just, just to add on a bit on that is gen our general approach, and I think this is sort of Audubon's general approach, is uh, we always try to collaborate first and, um, and find new partners actively. And I think whether that's in agriculture or in communities, and we need to keep stretching in order to do that. I think what we've seen, I think frankly in the last several years uh, with the federal government's shift on policies, is kind of an increasing balkanization between those that are considered environmentalists and other sectors. But we know, and we've learned this lesson, a tricolor blackbird is a classic example of this that Sammy has been a lead on, where we work with uh, industry partners who we might otherwise fight with. We can come up with solutions that are most, more sustainable for both sides. And so we kind of live by that credo of collaborate wherever we can and fight when we must. And sometimes we must. Uh, but we lead with the collaboration first. And so that's led us into partnerships uh, with things like wind and solar companies who on one day we might be collaborating and on the next day we might be up in front of a, a agency body disagreeing over a project or you know, um, certain uh, marine extraction and industries where you know, we might be litigating, but then we might also be working on a restoration project together. So we try to be flexible and not too black and white about um, how we approach those, those kind of potential conflicts. Yeah, awesome. Um, and maybe I'll, I'm gonna jump in and answer my own question <laughs> um, unashamedly, but um, you know, I, I, for me personally, I'm, I always loved animals, but was not a, a birder um, for most of my life. So um, my experience um, just learning more about birds and you know, the act of birding as well too has, provided me a little bit of an outsider's um, perspective as well too. So, you know, I, I get to share these, uh, like my own experiences with like my own friends who, again, are like musicians or people who are involved in environmental justice organizations um, or just like teachers or so many other um, different like folks have been interested in, in, in at least like the work um, now as well too. So I, I think there's definitely a lot of potential um, for, for all of us to, to build more, uh, a stronger network, more advocacy opportunities. And, you know, I, I think the more we demonstrate that there are um, diverse stakeholders in, in support of, of our overall issue for a healthy planet, um, I think we really can continue to show how um, an organization like Audubon can be effective on um, environmental advocacy. Um, again, not only for, for birds or not only for um, communities, but, um, everyone as well too. Um, so on that note, um, cue the uh, yellow billed uh, magpie. Um, <laughs> um, I wanted to uh, just circle, circle back to one specific ask um, as well too when we're, um, or since we've been talking about like coalitions and just increasing support about our messaging as well too. 
Um, one ask that we do have is for folks to get in contact with your assembly members um, in support of AB 3030. Um, and uh, Mike touched on it in, in passing, but there is a very important committee hearing on June 3rd, which is actually the day um, after Advocacy Day. <laughs> Um, so, so we definitely want to keep an eye um, to, to the actions that are happening outside of June 2nd because we know we still have two more months of a legislative session um, to be dealing with and a lot of us are trying to figure out what it means to push these issues um, when the legislature has not experienced these, an issue like COVID in over 100 years um, or the amount of um, drastic action that you have to take. Um, so again, we will just keep an eye out for an Advocacy Day Toolkit, but also um, keep an eye out for, um, for an email uh, from different Audubon staff. We are gonna be um, uh, now um, reaching out specifically to folks who have signed up for Advocacy Day. Um, and more broadly, if you are signed up, we're interested in um, you know, using, using the folks, um, the contact information from folks uh, whenever we hear about an important issue in July or in August during the rest of this legislative session that um, we're building off of our, our, our activities right now during these unprecedented times where we're all social distancing but remote uh, advocating and still loving birds. Um, so again, um, feel free to reach out to us. Um, reach out to myself um, at pedro.hernandez at audubon.org. Um, again, pedro.hernandez at audubon.org. Um, I will try to make myself as available as possible. I am pretty busy with Advocacy Day stuff, but I also want to make sure, um, you know, Audubon is responsive to everyone's questions as well, too. So I will be a resource. You will also have the rest of the posse team um, as a resource for you all. And also you'll have a, um, an Audubon staffer um, be reaching out to different chapters as well too. So we wanna make sure everyone feels prepared, um, ready and excited about, you know, this, this uh, experiment that we're all trying to do a um, virtual advocacy day. So um, thank you all again, feel free to reach out to Audubon California or myself. And I would really want to say thank you all um, for your time and you know, showing interest in the Central Valley. Um, I was, you know, I was born in Fresno, I live in Fresno, and I always try to find excuses to teach more people about the place that I live. And it's more than just somewhere you drive through um, to get to <laughs> San Francisco or Sacramento. Um, so again, thank you all. Um, and I hope everyone has a wonderful day and we will see you all hopefully on Friday. Take care, everyone. <laughs>